In this next series of lectures, we're going to be taking a look at a very big idea, functional core imperative shell. And this is something that's come to really impact how I write my systems. We're going to talk a little bit about why, what functional core imperative shell is and why it's valuable, but let's take a quick look at the project and see the improvements we're going to be making first. We're going to be working on this tic-tac-toe game. There's an entire series of lectures on how you can build this, but you don't have to watch that to continue watching this series. You can see it's just a very standard game and we have an undo and redo feature. And this is all working perfectly fine. However, I'm not happy with the implementation and we're going to take a look at some of the improvements we might like to make. Let's have a look at the game logic first. You can see here we have a single function called use tic-tac-toe. This is the only function and it contains all of the functionality for the entire game. It's exported and we head over to our app.view where we import the use tic-tac-toe composable. We destructure a bunch of properties or APIs. We then return them so they're available on the template and we build our game. Let's take a quick look at the implementation and see some of the improvements we might like to make. At the moment, we're mixing our business logic and our UI logic and we're doing quite a lot of mutation. So what do I mean by mutation? You can see here I have this new game state and we're actually mutating a specific part of this. We're getting a specific row and a specific column and updating the value, we're mutating it. A much more functional way of doing this would be to return a brand new game state which contains the updated value. After we mutate that, we come here and update this global boards variable by pushing the new state in. We update a global current counter variable and a current move value. The reason these are global is because they're not received as arguments to this function, so they must be declared somewhere else in the global scope. In this system it's very small so we can see they're declared right here, but in a very large system it might be difficult to track down what they're declared, where they're declared, and what the value is at any given time. What we'd like to do here is make this more functional and remove the mutation, so make move should really be returning a new game state with all the updated variables. Let's take a look at the test and see some of the problems we have over there. So you can see we have the make move test here. Everything starts off fine, we have this new variable, but immediately we see here we're calling make move. It's not returning a new value, so we have no idea what this is really doing. This means it must be mutating a global variable somewhere. We, we do know that is the current board variable. However, as we said, in a large system, very difficult to know what this is doing or what the new game state is going to be after this is being called. We then have another even bigger red flag down here. We have this undo function. It returns no value and it's called with no arguments. So we have no idea what it's doing until we actually go and look at the implementation. Even once you see the implementation, unless you knew the previous game state and the current game state, you have no idea what this is going to do or how it is going to change the system. What we really want to do is something like this. We create a new game state variable and that would be equal to undo where we pass in the current game state. And what that's going to do is tell the user exactly what this function is doing. It's going to take the current game state, update it without any mutation, and then we're going to return a new game state down here. It's much more clear what is going on and we're avoiding all the global mutation and the global variables. Let's take another look at that diagram we talked about earlier and see what this might mean. What this idea is referring to is the functional core is going to be a whole bunch of pure isolated, UI, uh, pure isolated business logic functions. And that's all these guys inside of here. For example, you can imagine the make move function will be uh, completely pure. It will be entirely dependent on its arguments. So we're always going to get the same result every time we call it. The, fun uh, the imperative shell here is going to be the outside of all these pure functions. We do have to have some mutation at some point or we can't actually do anything. And in this case, it's going to be a very thin view integration layer where we update the, the DOM and take user input. Now that we have a better idea of how this is going to work and why this is going to be better, let's head into the next lecture and see how we can start refactoring the system to follow this functional core imperative shell paradigm.